put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. Have you ever had an offer of fame and wealth, but at a price? Moses had this, but he refused it. And this is what we're going to look at right now. Let's continue with the story of Moses in the Egyptian palace. When one looks at the bust of this great Pharaoh, the Bible story becomes more real. God saved the life of this little boy because he had a special work for him to do. And the reason why you are still alive is because God also has a special work for you to do. An interesting discovery was recently made at the Sphinx, which mentions the son of Tutmosis I. The date of 1529 is very exciting because it is only one year after Moses was discovered in the Nile. Could this be a reference to Moses? Because Tutmosis I had no other sons. We must also bear in mind that when Hatshepsut adopted Moses, he became the official grandson of the Pharaoh. Here, somewhere in the Karnak palace, Tutmosis I offered to make Moses the next pharaoh. How would you react? There was no greater position of power and wealth in the ancient world than that of the pharaoh. Listen to these immortal words. Hebrews 11.24 By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. You're looking at some of the treasures found in the tomb of Tut Amun. Moses could have had a much bigger tomb and more treasures, but he refused it all. The next verse gives us an insight into this man's character. He chose to be ill-treated along with the people of God rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. This behavior reminds us of Jesus who also chose to be ill-treated with us in order to save us. Amongst the treasures found in Tutankhamun's tomb, they found this beautiful throne. Moses could have been depicted on a throne like this. What influence his choice not to take it. Verse 27 says, He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. Moses made the right decision. Instead of becoming the greatest pharaoh of antiquity and subsequently a dried up mummy, he received a special resurrection according to Jude, verse 9. And even today he is enjoying the luxury of heaven and the presence of the only true God. To walk where Moses walked is quite an experience. In my mind's eye, I can see him here at Deir al-Bari talking to his stepmother, Hatshepsut. While he associated with this exceptional lady who explored many parts of the ancient world, he received all the preparation necessary to become the leader who rescued two million people from Egypt. Act 7.22 says, Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action, had a doctorate in Egyptian literature, and knew the 2,400 letter hieroglyphics alphabet by heart. He also had a doctorate in science, art, medicine, warfare, etc. Because Moses refused to become the next pharaoh, a man by the name of Tutmosis II ascended the throne. He was just a commoner and was married to Hatshepsut. Next time, we will continue the gripping story of Moses. We are going to follow him from fame to shame. We are going to look at God's long-suffering and forgiveness. We are going to study about his interest in sinners like you and me. He is a God who never gives up on someone who has fallen. In our next lecture, we are going to study God's love, how it treats fallen people. If you have fallen, Watch the next presentation. You'll get new hope because God is a great God, a forgiving God, a gracious God, and a loving God. God bless you. Till next time. Put the puzzle together. 
piece by piece and discover the whole truth. Today we're going to deal with two beasts that become friends. Now we know from the book of Daniel that a beast is a political power and so we have to find out what the book of Revelation is trying to tell us. We're going to move in the stream of time to our time. You will remember that uh, in the book of Daniel we discussed the prophecy in Daniel 2, the statue, which goes through the time periods. In Daniel chapter 7 we went through the same time periods with beasts as examples. And the book of Daniel forms the template for the book of Revelation. We also discussed the little horn power of Daniel chapter 7 who would be different from the first, who was secular as well as religious. And the reformers clearly stated who this power was according to their interpretation of Scripture. And the fourth beast, they put Julius Caesar there so that everybody would know they were talking about Rome. When it came to the little horn power, they were very clear in their denunciation. Martin Luther said the Pope was the Antichrist. We dealt with that very clearly. Calvin said exactly the same thing. And Wesley said he is an emphatic sense, the man of sin. He increases all manner of sin above measure. So the Reformation was very, very clear on its doctrine regarding the Antichrist. John Knox, who preached in Scotland, said that the papacy should be recognized as the Antichrist. And this was the power that would speak great words against the Most High, wear out the saints of the Most High, think to change the times and the laws of God. We dealt with all of those issues in previous lectures. They shall be given into his hand a time, times, and the dividing of times. This was the definition as we found it in the book of Daniel. Now remember that the book of Daniel is the key to unlocking the prophecies of the book of Revelation. So let's go to Revelation chapter 13 and see if we can pick up the images and uh, determine who and what they stand for. Well, here we have a beast. We know that's a political entity. And it is described for us in some magnificent detail. So let us have a look at the first beast. And I stood upon the sand of the sea. Remember the seas of the nations, the multitudes. And I saw a beast, the political entity, rise up out of the sea, the nations, the multitudes, having seven heads and ten horns. Now the number ten reminds us of the ten toes or the ten horns of the fourth beast in Daniel 7. And... Uh, Seven heads, those are very important. Going through a stream of time, we'll deal with that in a later lecture, but the number seven also has something to do with God. So this is a beast that has God attitudes or claims to have God attitudes. And it has ten horns, and upon the heads the names of blasphemy. Remember the blasphemy? It was on the little horn power in Daniel 7. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard. There was a leopard in Daniel 7. His feet were as the feet of a bear. There was a bear in Daniel 7. His mouth as the mouth of the lion. There was a lion in Daniel 7. And uh, we see them in reverse sequence here. So the prophet was looking ahead in the case of Daniel and looking down the stream of time backwards in the case of John, as he describes this creature. Now it has, obviously, the attributes of the bear, the leopard, and the lion. So it has Babylonian attributes, it has Medo-Persian attributes, it has Greek attributes, and it speaks with the mouth of a lion. It has the language of Babylon. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Now the dragon in Revelation chapter 12, which we haven't dealt with yet, is a reference to Rome. And it's also a reference to Satan. So through the Roman Empire, he receives his power directly from God's adversary. This is what the book of Revelation tells us. And he gave him his seat and great authority. So this power that arose amongst the nations has the attributes of the little horn and if it has the same attributes it must be the same power 
And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world, universal power, wandered after the beast. So this power will have universal do dominion, but not before it receives a mortal wound as a beast, as a political entity, which must then be healed, and then it gets universal dominion. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? Revelation 13, 4. So this power must have control over the secular powers. And if you cross it, well, then you will have to face the consequences, according to this text. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. Remember the little horn power had the same attribute? And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Here's a time prophecy. The little horn power had a time prophecy. Three and a half years, prophetically speaking. Forty-two months is exactly the same time period. Forty-two months, the prophetic month has thirty days. Forty-two times thirty, one thousand two hundred and sixty so the same time period applies to this power as to the little horn power. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, that's the character of God, his tabernacle, that's his sanctuary service, his mediation, and them that dwell in heaven. Very, very informative. Revelation 13, 5 and 6. We discussed blasphemy before. Let's briefly look at it again. Blasphemy in the Bible. Remember that when the Jews answered Jesus, they said to him, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because thou being a man, makest thyself God. So this power, blasphemous power, must have the same attribute, because he opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, and shows himself to be God, as we see in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 4. Now, the Bible defines blasphemy as assuming any rights or power that belong to God alone. And this is what they said. Now, we're just recapping in Revelation 13 what we already know from Daniel chapter 7 regarding the little horn. The Pope is of so great dignity and so exalted that he is not a mere man, but as it were God and the vicar of God. Ferraris Ecclesiastical Dictionary. So here is a claim that he is God. Cardinal Balamine says, All the names which in Scripture are applied to Christ, by virtue of which it is established that he is over the church, all the same names are applied to the Pope. So he takes upon himself the titles of Jesus Christ. The attributes of Jesus Christ, well, he has them too, infallibility. This is from the book, More Answers to Your Questions, from uh, Father Bonaventure Hinwood, spokesman for the Roman Catholic Church, he says, There are occasions on which the Pope, in carrying out his responsibility as the shepherd and teacher of all Christians, makes use of his supreme apostolic authority to state clearly that a particular teaching about faith and morals must be held by the whole Church. On these occasions, the divine help promised through St. Peter to his successor comes into operation. This assistance ensures that the Pope ensures in the Pope that freedom from error which Christ willed for his church when it comes to passing on truth about faith or morals which he revealed. These decisions of the Pope are final and are not subject to the church's further approval. So he speaks ex cathedra, infallibly. Thus, whenever the Pope makes full use of his power as visible head of the church, he acts as head of the apostolic college. This is the reason why Vatican I insisted that when the Pope exercises his supreme teaching authority, he is protected from error by that same infallibility which Christ willed for his church. So this Pope receives the charisma of infallibility when he is crowned. So he has the attributes of Jesus. He is infallible. And Pope Boniface in his Bull Unang Sanctum stated, The Roman Pontiff judges all men, but is judged by no one. We declare, assert, define and pronounce that be subject to the Roman Pontiff is to every creature altogether necessary for salvation. That which was spoken of Christ, thou subdued all things under his feet, may well be verified of me. I have the authority of the King of Kings, there's the title. 
I am all and above all, so that God himself and I, the vicar of God, have but one consistency and able to do all that God can do. What therefore can you make of me but God? So this power has these attributes that uh, the Bible speaks about. In fact, when there was the assassination attempt on John Paul II, Time magazine wrote, it's like shooting God. So this concept has infiltrated the minds of men. We define that the Holy Apostolic See and the Roman Pontiff holds the primacy over the whole world. So here we have this issue of universality. So the power that we see in Revelation chapter 13 described there as this conglomerate beast power with bare attributes. They have the attributes of Mithraism with the triple crown aspects and all of the issues associated with Medo-Persian rule ensconced in Roman Catholic theology. There are aspects of the Greek philosophy and there are, of course, aspects of Roman philosophy within this beast power, this political entity. Thomas Aquinas wrote, secular power is subject to the spiritual power as the body is subject to the soul. And therefore it is not usurpation of authority if the spiritual prelate interfere in temporal things concerning these matters in which the secular power is subject to him. So the state has to be in subjection to the authority of the papacy. And the Council of Trent, Trent declared, all temporal power is his, the dominion, the jurisdiction, the government of the whole earth. Here is this universality again. By divine right, all rulers of the earth are his subjects and must submit to him. Fascinating. Now the second point where we find the definition of blasphemy is where the scribes began to reason amongst each other because Jesus forgave sins. And they said, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Luke 5, 21. And the Roman Catholics make the same statement. God himself is obliged to abide by the judgment of his priests and either not to pardon or to pardon as according as they refuse or give absolution. The sentence of the priest precedes and God subscribes to it. So they claim that they can forgive sins. And the Bible says power was given unto him to continue 40 and 2 months. For, for the prophetic time period, which is the same as that in the book of Daniel applied to the little horn, he had power to exercise this authority over the kingdoms that he ruled over. 42 months, 42 times 30 is 1,260 days. We can make that years because Ezekiel 4 verse 6 says, I have given you a day for a year. So let's apply the day year principle and if the shoe fits, then we can put it on. Vigilus ascended the papal chair 538 AD under the military protection of Belisarius. That's history. So we have a starting date when this church receives horn or beast stature, political stature. The legally recognized supremacy of the Pope began in 538 AD when they went into effect the decree of the Emperor Justinian making the Bishop of Rome head over all the churches, the definer of doctrine and the corrector of heretics. So we have a starting date. Lebanka, professor of church history in the University of Rome says, to the succession of the Caesars came the succession of the pontiffs in Rome. When Constantine left Rome, he gave his seat to the pontiff. So here we get this political power, this horn power, this beast power. So the Church of Rome has two aspects. It has beast component, which by definition is political, and it has woman component, which by definition is ecclesiastical. 1,260 years, let's add that to that, we get to 1798. And I saw one of the heads, as it were, wounded to death. So does the papacy as a beast, as a political entity, receive a mortal wound in 1798? Yes. In 1798, Bertia made his entrance into Rome, abolished the papal government, so the beast component dies and establishes a secular one. Encyclopedia Americana. 
Berthier entered Rome on the 10th of February 1798 and proclaimed a republic. Half of Europe thought Napoleon's veto would be obeyed and with the Pope, the papacy was dead. It's interesting how the historians echo the language of the Bible here in the modern papacy by Reverend Joseph Rickaby. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, and power was given him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. Revelation 13, 7. So this first beast in Revelation also has the persecuting aspects of the little horned power of Daniel chapter 7. And eventually all the nations will become subject to him. Well, that is also history. The Inquisition proved that they persecuted God's people over the ages. Here's the Tower of London, the Hague in the Netherlands. And for what? For heresy. Deciding for oneself what one wants to believe. You see, what you believe had to be defined by the prelates and not by the individuals. I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death. We now have a date, 1798. His deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. Revelation 13.3. The question is, when was this wound healed, and how was it healed? Historically, Rome received its political power back in 1929 when Mussolini and Gaspari made a historic pact. Here the San Francisco Chronicle reports the event and note the, the biblical terminology. The Roman question tonight was a thing of the past and the Vatican was at peace with Italy. In affixing the autographs to the memorable document, Healing the Wound, extreme cordiality was displayed on both sides. So when the Vatican state was reinstated with a smaller territory, it again received beast status. So the beast, the political side of the Roman Catholic Church, had a time period of supremacy, 1,260 years. And then it received a mortal wound. The political power ceased, at least on the surface, and by legislation. And then in 1929, it was reinstated by this historic pact between Mussolini and the papacy. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So this small new beginning would culminate in a tremendous expansion of power until all nations were subject to him. You might ask, is this possible? It is not only possible, it is a fact. And when we look into the way in which it was done, it is amazing. It is absolutely stunning. But we will deal with that later. So we're dealing with a universal, secular, religious power with political status and with religious status. And Rome is the only one on the planet that qualifies. Now, did this small beginning in 1929 grow to something big, as the Bible predicts, that the whole world would eventually look to Rome for leadership? Well, this is the funeral of Pope John Paul II. This is the most televised event in the history of mankind. What a spectacle it presented to the world. Here we see the people gathering at Rome for this event. The BBC reported the following. The Pope was the only one to be a world evangelist. He could visit all faiths, Islam and Judaism. He prepared the way for a religious new world order where all the religions would work together to find a solution. And this Pope played a major role. On Larry King Live after Pope John Paul's death on the 2nd of April 2005, the leader of the Protestant world, Billy Graham, said that the Pope was the moral leader of the world. This is a great distancing from the position that was taken by the Reformers. 
So something has happened. Protestantism has come back in line and there is again a communication between these two groups. Politically, all the political leaders of note in the world were there, whether they publicly voiced opposition in, the, in former times or not, is immaterial. They were presented, the leaders of Britain, we even have Fidel Castro presented, the princes of the world had to postpone their weddings, the political leaders of the entire world were there in great show of force. And Newsweek had this interesting thing to say. Under John Paul II, who helped bring down the Iron Curtain, the Holy See gained more political clout than it had enjoyed since the Renaissance. Can you see the mortal wound healing? And the political clout that it had in the 1,260 days, how it is returning to the fold of Rome. So the prophet sees in the stream of time a power receiving a mortal wound, rising from the ashes in a mini death and resurrection as Antichrist. It emulates Christ. It has a death and it has a resurrection. And it has dominion over the whole world before the coming of Christ. And if any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So the first beast, which is the same because it has the same attributes as the little horn, of Daniel chapter 7 is shown here in Revelation chapter 13. This beast receives a mortal wound by the sword. It is killed. We have a date, 1798, and he is led into captivity. The Pope is taken captive in exile in, to Valence, and there he dies. And then later in 1929, the mortal wound is healed. So Revelation 13, 9 and 10 tell us the point where the papacy receives the mortal wound, 1798. And this date is very fascinating in terms of other hi historic parameters as well. Now note what happens. The prophet looks around and he sees another beast. The second beast of Revelation chapter 13. And I saw another beast come up out of the earth, and it had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. Revelation 13, 11. Fascinating. So the first beast receives a mortal wound. We have a date, 1798. The prophet sees the first beast dying and receiving the mortal wound, and he looks around and he sees a second beast rising, not out of the sea, not out of the multitudes, but out of the earth, the place devoid of nations with political status. So he speaks like a dragon, although he has this lamb-like consistency. John Wesley wrote in his notes on Revelation 13, which were written in 1754, he says of this beast, he is not yet come. Though he cannot be far off, for he is to appear at the end of the 42 months of the first beast. Remember the reformers placed the symbols of Daniel chapter 7 in stone. They understood the prophecies. They applied the prophecies to the papacy. And here this Protestant is saying, after studying the prophecies, that the second beast must appear soon because he has not yet come, but he must appear at the end of the 42 months. So after 1798, the second beast must arise. In the next session, we will discuss the second beast. Put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. Put the puzzle together, piece by piece, and discover the whole truth. Remember that the reformers knew exactly who the first beast was, and uh, 
Wesley predicted that the second one would arise after the 42 months. So let us see what the Bible has to say about this second beast. Sadly, there is only one power that can qualify in terms of all the features of Revelation chapter 13, which describe the attributes of the second beast. Let us have a look at the rise of the USA. It has to be a power that arises after 1798. The Declaration of Independence came in 1776. It also has to arise out of the earth, not amongst the multitude of nations. Now, there were tribes in North America, but there were no constituted political entities which would qualify as horn or beast powers. So here arises a constituted political power in an area devoid of such political entities. 1776, Declaration of Independence. 1783, the independence is acknowledged by most of the world. 1787, a constitution is framed. You become a political entity only if you have a constitution on which your government is based. 1791, the Bill of Rights is added. And 1798, fascinating, recognition by France. So the first beast receives the mortal wound by the hand of France, and the second beast is recognized by the same mega power of Europe in the same year, 1798. And France sends a gift of the Statue of Liberty, and the second beast receives political stature. There is only one power with so much political clout fulfilling all of these attributes, and sadly, it is the United States of America. Does it have lamb-like attributes? Yes. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. But no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Oxford History of the American People. Beautiful lamb-like attributes in this Constitution, which promise freedom of religion. The first power was a persecuting power that said, if you don't do it my way, you will be classed as a heretic, and you will be subject to the penalty of heretics. And that's when you had persecution and an inquisition and the funeral pyres were lit all over Europe. Now the sad statement in Revelation is that the second beast, although it has these lamb-like principles, will speak like a dragon. Well, the first beast received its power from the dragon, and so we will have to find out what dragon language is like by going back to the first beast and asking it, what does dragon language sound like? He spoke as a dragon. So what were the statements of the first beast? This is the syllabus of Pope Pius, December 1864. Remember that the Church of Rome sits with the infallibility issue and that decisions of previous councils cannot be ignored by subsequent councils. So what was said in the past is still valid today. Quote, The state has not the right to leave every man free to embrace whatever religion he shall deem true. The church has the right to require that the Catholic religion shall be the religion of the state to the exclusion of all others. Cursed be those who assert liberty of conscience and of worship and such that maintain that the church may not employ force. So here you have dragon language, which is the opposite to the American Constitution. Is it possible that the second beast would at some stage change its tune and begin talking like the first beast? The Roman Catholic Church must demand the right to freedom for herself alone. La Civita Catholica, which is the official Jesuit mouthpiece of, of, of Rome. The Roman Catholic is to wield his vote to the purpose of securing Catholic ascendancy in this country. Catholic world, July 1870, speaking about the United States. 
Now, Revelation tells us that the second beast exercises all the authority of the first beast. Now, the first beast had religious and secular authority over all the other political entities. And the second beast, the United States of America, will attain that same power and will cause the earth and those dwelling it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. So in other words, the moral dictates of the first beast will be made universal and will be enforced by the second beast. So papal morality will become the standard for humanity and the secular power pushing the issue will be the United States of America. Unbelievable! Impossible according to the American Constitution, but the Bible says that the lamb-like principles will be replaced by dragon-like principles. And it does great wonders, the second beast, so that it makes fire come down from heaven unto the earth in the sight of men, and it deceives, an important word, those dwelling on the earth because of the miracles which were given to it before the beast, saying to those dwelling on the earth that they should make an image to the beast who had the wound by the sword and lived. Well, these are great words. So by tremendous signs and miracles, it will deceive the world into believing that it has the support of the deity. And it will make an image to the first beast. Now, what was the first beast like? The first beast was a religio-political power. It wielded secular power as well as religious power. Is it possible that church and state would merge in the United States and thereby become what the first beast was, a religio-political beast? Then it will have two horns of power, a religious and a secular. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Revelation 13, 15. So when do I worship somebody? is when I obey Him rather than my conscience towards God. And that is what this predicts. So here you have, even in the architecture, this image emerging. There on the left we have St. Peter's, and on the right we have the Capitol, and architecturally they are an image of each other. So we have a union of of church and state predicted in the Bible. Now, when there was an image in the past in the time of Daniel and everybody had to bow down, there were some interesting things that took place. Daniel 3.15, now when you hear the sound of all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good, but if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing fire. Is it possible that music will play an important role to whip up the emotions and bring people into line with this new kind of thinking? Did Protestantism change its tune and instead of advocating the separation of church and state and advocating a total separation from ecclesiastical interference in government affairs? Well, Billy Graham, the Protestant leader of the world, visited the Pope. And it was through Billy Graham's intervention that the former president, Ronald Reagan of the United States, set up an ambassador to the Vatican, something which the Constitution forbids and which Truman tried before but failed. Billy Graham writes, Reagan was the first American president to appoint a full ambassador to the Vatican. Before he made the appointment, he asked my view. I told him I thought it would probably be a good thing in spite of a number of potential problems concerning the separation of church and state, and wrote an extended confidential letter outlining my reasons. Among other things, I told him I did not think it necessarily violated the separation of church and state. For whatever reason, Mr. Reagan went ahead with the plan. Later, my letter was leaked to the press. It caused some consternation amongst my Baptist friends. This is the autobiography of Billy Graham. Now, fascinating. Here, a Protestant leader says, Go ahead, even though the Constitution actually forbids it. And since that time, church and state are seen visibly working together 
on a far more basic level. And the newspapers, this is the Sunday Times, says church and state merge under Bush, something which the Bible predicted, and we are now finding its fulfillment in the history of the United States. In fact, every single principle up until the time of Kennedy has been turned upside down by these thunderous modern events. Kennedy said the following, you can find this also in the Sunday Times as they quote it, it says, I believe in an America where the separation of church and state is absolute, where no Catholic prelate would tell the president should he be Catholic how to act and no Protestant minister would tell his parishioners for whom to vote, where no church school is granted any public funds or political preference where no public official either requests or accepts instructions on public policy from the Pope or any other ecclesiastical source, where no religious body seeks to impose its will directly or indirectly upon the general populace or the public acts of its officials. Fascinating. Here is President Kennedy expounding the principles of the lamb-like attributes of the Constitution. There will be no persecution and no interference, not in terms of funding and not in terms of voting. Did things change since then? The Bible said they would change. Vatican ambassador, I believe the United States is the world's only superpower and the Holy See as the only worldwide moral political sovereignty have significant roles to play. Their actions will impact the lives of people in all parts of the globe. Here is the United States ambassador to the Vatican saying this will be a universal issue, just as the Bible predicts. And uh, the President of the United States said, The best way to honor Pope John Paul II, truly one of the great men, is to take his teachings seriously, is to listen to the words and put his words and teachings into action here in America. This is a challenge we must accept. And note this, Kennedy said, No prelate. No pope, no parishioner, nobody will prescribe to voters how to vote or how to apply their legislation. Here we have the bishops' politicians' uh, meeting in March 13, 2006. Catholic News Services reports that conscience must concur with church's moral teachings. So here the church is prescribing to the politicians. Responding to a recent statement by Catholic Democrats in the House of Representatives affirming the primacy of conscience in their voting decisions, three key leaders of the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops said, Conscience must be consistent with the fundamental moral principles, including the Church's opposition to abortion. So the Church is prescribing morality. As members of the Church, all Catholics are obliged to shape our conscience in according with the moral teachings of the church. So the church prescribing to the voters what to vote. And did Bush overturn an aspect of Kennedy's resolutions? Absolutely. Bush urges groups to bid for funding for faith-based initiatives. We read this in Catholic News Services, March 2006. Washington, President Bush urged faith-based charities to bid competitively for federal funding. In a luncheon speech at a day-long national conference on faith-based and community initiatives, Bush said that progress had been made, but much more needs to be done in terms of this state and church cooperation. And interestingly, he said, it used to be that groups were prohibited from receiving any federal funding whatsoever because they had a cross or a star or a crescent on the wall, Bush said, and that's changed for the better. So here we have a complete change of thinking. We're moving in a new direction. And the Protestant leaders, instead of preaching the doctrine of the Antichrist, are saying, let's reconcile. Robert Schuller said, it's time for Protestants to go to the shepherd, the Pope and say, what do we have to do to come home? Rick Warren, he said the same thing. He said, the first Reformation was divisive. The first one divided the church. This time it will unify the church. And how do they do it? How come 
Protestantism does not rely on the thus says the word as it did before, but is now reacting to all of these changes as though there was not a sign of any of this history between the various powers. Remember, he performed great and miraculous signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to earth in full view of men. Where do these mega-religious phenomena come from in the world? Isn't it from the United States of America? Isn't it through the tele-evangelism that the power religion and the outpouring religion is proclaimed throughout the world, which is leading to a new communion with Rome, which the Bible predicted would happen. And because of the signs he was given power to do on behalf of the first beast, he deceived the inhabitants of the earth. This is a terrible indictment. Is it possible that there are deceptive powers at work which are leading people again to subject themselves to the moral teachings of Rome, which are contrary to the clear biblical injunctions? Is it possible that the United States is moving the world in a direction so that the first beast will be honored and worshipped rather than the dictates of God? The Bible predicts that this is exactly what will happen. Now remember in Acts chapter 2, when there was the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. And these tongues of fire were the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Now is it possible that the fire coming down from heaven in the mega preaching that emulates or comes from that country is it possible that this fire has a deceptive power and is maybe leading people astray? Do you think it is possible that the prophet was looking ahead in the stream of time and seeing the mega movements in religion of our time? He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Revelation 13, 5. Now an image, remember, is something that looks like the original. If I stand in front of a mirror and I look at myself, I see an image. Now the first beast was a religio-political power, and an image would have to be a religio-political power. The first beast could dictate and cause as many as would not obey and worship it rather than their conscience and the dictates of the Bible to be killed. Is it possible that the image could do exactly the same thing? The new religio-political power that emerges here in the second beast can dictate to the world to accept the morality of the first beast, and if they refuse, that the consequences would be the same as they were in the Dark Ages? This is what the Bible seems to predict. And sadly, we can see it happening. The worthies refuse to bow down to the image. And the whole rest of the world in the Babylonian times bow down at the command. The image was made of gold from top to bottom. God had said the image would change from gold to silver, to bronze, to iron, to feet of iron and clay. Nebuchadnezzar said no. I defy God's authority. I stand up as a man against you and I have my authority dictate. You will make the image gold from top to bottom and you will obey my dictates, not those of God. And everybody will show their allegiance by bowing down. But the word of God had said, Thou shalt not make for yourself an image. Thou shalt not bow down to it. And so those who trusted in their God refused to bow down. It is a mistake to apply American democratic procedures to faith and truth. 
time, January 1995. Here we have a change of tune. We are beginning to hear a different sound. The lamb-like principles are disappearing. State bows to the church. Kennedy said it must never happen. USA Today reports President Bush, his wife Laura, his father, former President George Bush, former President Bill Clinton, Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, knelt in a pew in front of the body, bowing their heads. And what did the Vatican City say after that event? The following. In death, Pope John Paul II had achieved what he failed to do in life, bringing the commander-in-chief of the world's superpower to his knees. George W. Bush made history yesterday as the first American president to attend a papal funeral, kneeling in silent prayer before the Catholic leader who opposed U.S. intervention in Iraq. Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice and First Lady Laura Bush also knelt in homage, black veils covering their bowed heads along former President Bill Clinton, George Bush Sr., White House Chief of Staff, Andy Card. In all the history of the United States, no president has ever attended a papal funeral. And after the death of Kennedy, things rapidly changed, and that which he denounced has become public policy. And we have come to the point where the Vatican says, we have made the commander-in-chief of the world's superpower bow the knee. Chief Justice William Rehnquist, who was Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, said, The wall of separation between church and state is a metaphor based on bad history. Now that is rather a sad statement, because it was ensconced and put in place for no other reason than to ensure religious freedom. The Moral Majority Coalition, organized following the 2004 election, has the following to say. As national chairman of the moral majority, I am committed to lending my influence to help send out at least 40 million evangelical voters in 2008. So you had Catholic prelates dictate how to vote, and now you have Protestant prelates dictating how to vote. In other words, the image of the beast is rising, we will be organized in all 50 states and enlisting and training millions of Americans to become partners in this exciting task of bringing this nation back to the moral values of faith and family on which it was founded. That is Jerry Falwell speaking from the Moral Majority website. Isn't this fascinating? So the Bible predicts that the second beast will follow in the steps of the first beast and that the moral values of the first beast will become universally enforced by the second beast. And here we hear and see the voices. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand and in their forehead, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Now that is quite a mouthful. What is the mark of the beast? How will it be implemented? What is the number of the beast? What is the number of his name? These are issues which we will have to discuss in some detail in the next lectures. Here is wisdom. Let him that has understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. Please note that it is not the number of a computer, nor is it the number of a mega computer anywhere in the world. It is the number of a man. And his number is 603 score and 6666. The Bible predicts that there will be a power in history that will be the same power as we had in Daniel chapter 7. This power is an ecclesiastical political entity that dictates to the entire world what the moral standard of the world should be. A second beast, a second political entity would rise 
and although it has lamb-like constitutional attributes, would change and start to speak like a dragon. And we saw that the dragon does not tolerate freedom of religious choice, but dictates the moral values of Rome. And the second beast would be induced to make an image to the first beast, to become like it, and for church and state to come together and form a union to dictate to the moral conscience of mankind. But the morality will be papal morality. And the mark of the first beast will be enforced upon the world. And if we have wisdom, we can calculate the number of the beast and we can also calculate the number of the man. And this will be our task in the next lecture when we will discuss these issues and see what are the moral issues that will be dictated to, to the whole world. May God bless us as we study these things. Thank you.